All right, brethren, Exodus 32. Now, last time we saw them dancing around the golden calf and Moses was in the mount. He made intercession for them. Now, Moses, we read in verse 15, he turns and he goes down from the mount. And he has the two tables of testimony, the two tables of covenant, the law in his hand, written on both sides, one side and on the other. And this was the work of God. This was the, the writing of God graven upon tables. Now we know when our Lord Jesus Christ came into this earth, he said the law is written on my heart. He didn't have the law on the table. He had the law in his heart. He came to represent his people, and he did. And he totally, thoroughly, completely fulfilled the law on behalf of his people. And when he comes to us in grace, he writes his law on our hearts. The law of everlasting grace, covenant grace, the law of faith and the law of love and the law of liberty, the law of righteousness. So we hear the law condemn us and we begin to follow him. That's what we saw Thursday night. You're manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ. He wrote this epistle, not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. This is only what Christ can do. Now we see a type here in Moses of how Christ works this in the hearts of his people, bringing us to be consecrated to Christ our righteousness. This is how, Mo how Christ works this. I've, I've titled this, Christ Consecrating Us to God. And that's the picture here. Now, it says there in verse 17, when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. Joshua was a man of war. He, he understood war, and, he, and that's us by nature. That's us by nature. We're men of war by nature. We, we, we're eager to fight by nature. And Joshua wasn't in the mount with God. He was near, went up with Moses near, but he wasn't in the mount with God. And he didn't have the discernment to know what Moses knew. Moses been with God. And God had told him what was going on down there. Now, brethren, you and I don't always know what's going on in the heart. We judge after the seeing eye and the hearing ear, and that's unrighteous judgment. Christ knows what's going on in the heart. He knows what's going on in the heart. And Moses corrects him here, and he tells him, nope, that's not what it is. It's the voice of singing. Voice of singing. And so they came down, and... As soon as Moses saw the calf and the dancing, Moses, Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. You think there's any religious person in our day who would have done that? They put them up in the museum. <laughs> that was the finger of God wrote those tables. Moses threw them down and broke them, and God never once condemns him for doing it. He never once condemns him for doing it. Because it was a lesson. It was important for God's people in every generation to see. And here's the first thing. Christ is going to make you behold first off. I'm saying in the first hour, and let me say this and get it out of the way. He does this consecrating work in the first time he reveals himself to you. But he continues to do this every time he turns us from our sin or grows us in him or turns us to him more. This is an ongoing thing. It never stops. But here's the first thing he's going to do. He's going to make us see we're guilty before the law. We're guilty before the law. We got to be silenced. We got to be shut up. That's the first thing. So his, he waxed hot in anger. He cast the tables out of his hand. He break them in the mouth. Now you imagine this vain show. They're down there dancing, hooping and hollering and going around this idol and going through a big vain show. And all of a sudden, and I'm sure Moses shouted to the top of his lungs, and they all looked up, and Moses took the tables that he brought down out of that mound and threw them down and broke them. And I bet you there was a hush over the whole crowd. Everything shut up. We didn't know what become of him. Now here he is. Can you imagine how it's going to be when Christ returns from the mount? That's how it's going to be. Everybody's going to shut up for once in their life. Everybody's going to shut up. That's what he's got to do in our heart. He's got to shut us up. Now, it's obvious that 
natural man, religious man, can see that it's, it, that it's breaking the law and it's pouring contempt on the law whenever somebody commits some immoral act of sin. And that is, that's breaking the law. That's pouring contempt on God and his law, on Christ and his law. It surely is. But what men don't see and what me, you and I lose sight of and are blinded to is, is when we try to take the law in our hands and we start trying to affect obedience with it, either in us or in others, we're just as big an idolaters dancing around our golden ox as they were. And the ox is us. And we're just as stubborn as an ox. It takes God to come and break the stony heart. Only Christ can do this and make you see you're guilty. We know what things soever the law says. It says to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped. And all the world become guilty before God. And therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And when you think of the law and you hear that word, don't only think of the Ten Commandments. This right here is the law of God. And we take this book in our hands right here and we're going to whip and we're going we're gonna, to uh, shame and we're going to affect obedience with it. We're dancing around the golden ox. Then Christ is going to have to show us that idol and show us it's unprofitable. It says here in verse 20, the first thing he's going to do is shut our mouths in guilt. He's going to make you see, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. And then he's going to show you the idol's worthless. He said in verse 20, He took the calf which they had made, he burned it in the fire, he ground it to powder, and he strawed it on the water, and he made the children of Israel drink of it. Moses showed them that this, this thing that they said, this is our gods that brought us out of Egypt. Moses come down and showed them and that thing they called a god didn't have power to save itself, much less them. He destroyed it right in front of their face and showed them this thing don't have any power. It's not God. And that's what Christ is going to show you and me. The idol called self doesn't have any power. He's unprofitable. He can't save himself from a sore finger, much less from his sin. And it says there, he ground it to powder. He's going to make you see. When he got finished with that idol, they couldn't use that gold for nothing. He ground it up with powder and, and threw, it in a, threw it in the river. And they couldn't do nothing with it. It was unprofitable. He's going to make us see our idol is totally unprofitable. And then he made them drink it. He took some of it and made them drink it. Christ, what do you reckon that tasted like? This water out of this creek that coming down out of the mount and a bunch of ground up gold in it. I don't know, but I can tell you this. When Christ does this to us, he's going to make our sin extremely bitter to us. It's going to be bitter to us. And I'll tell you something else. When they drank it, nothing happened. Christ is going to make you see it's not what goes into the mouth that's defiling you. It's the heart that's in you that's defiling you. And another thing he's going to do is he's going to make your sin to be one with you. He made them drink that idol so that it was one with them. He's going to make us on our sin as being our sin and then he's going to make sin personal to us he's going to make it real personal to us he rebukes personally in the heart God does, Christ does, he rebukes you in the heart and he's going to make his child take sides with God against ourselves now watch what happened here, this is very instructive, verse 21 Moses said to Aaron, what did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them. That was a tremendous rebuke. That was a tremendous rebuke. What did they do to you to make you bring so great a sin on them? God's going to have to convict us in our heart 
and make us see that what we've done hasn't helped God's people. He's hurt them. He's hurt them. And Aaron did what Adam did. He's a good picture of Adam here because if you notice the last words of it, it says, God said, I'm going to plague the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. They didn't touch it. Aaron made it, but they made it. And we weren't in the garden, but we did what Adam did. We did it just as real. And they made that calf just as real as Aaron did because he was, he was leading them. He was the head. And they did what he did. But Adam did what, uh, Aaron did what Adam did. He led the people into sin. He brought a great sin upon the people. And Christ is going to come to us in power. And he's going to come personally. And he's going to say, you're the man. You're the man. And what... What was Aaron doing whenever Moses revealed to him, you're the one? That's what he revealed to him. You brought this great sin upon them. And what was Aaron doing? What, what, what was he saying in his heart when, when Moses said this? It came out. He said, they're to blame. That one's to blame. I didn't, I'm not to blame. They're to blame. Look at it. He did just what Adam did in the garden. Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people. They're set on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what came of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. And they gave it to me, and I put it in a fire. And this calf just popped out. When we're pointing the finger and saying they're to blame, who does that? Which of us here does that? Every one of us. When you're driving down the road and you're thinking over what just happened in the store and you're saying, well, they shouldn't have done that. that if, the only reason I said what I said is because of what they did. Blah, 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 blah. You're saying it's their fault. And this is the knee-jerk reaction of our flesh is to defend ourselves at the expense of others. And we don't care who the others are. We don't care. If it comes down to justifying me, we will condemn God's own people. But I want you to notice something here. Notice... Moses doesn't press him. Moses didn't, he didn't rebuke him. He didn't, he didn't come back with something when he said this. He did something better. This is what Christ does. When we're in our state of pointing the finger and blaming the other, this is what Christ does. This is how he converts you in the first hour. This is how he converts us in every hour from our sin. He makes us take sides with God against ourselves. Look at what Moses did, verse 25. When Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp, and he said, Who is on the Lord's side? This was Moses' answer to what Aaron just said. He went to the gate, and he stood up in the gate. It's a picture of proclamation of the gospel. It's a picture of what Christ does through the gospel. And he stood up and he said, who is on the Lord's side? There ain't but one side. It's the Lord's side. Let him come to me, Moses said. That's a picture of Christ. Who's on the Lord's side? Let him come to me. You want to be saved? You want to be you want to be saved from idolatry and from self-justification and from the sin that we are so wickedly committing constantly? Go to Christ. Be on his side. And all the sons of Levi 
gather themselves together unto him. Now here's the great question. Who's on the Lord's side? Instead of making Aaron confess one particular sin, yes, I've made the idol. Instead of making him confess that sin, instead of making him say, Moses, you're lying right now. These people didn't make you do this. Instead of making him confess that sin, he made him confess all his sin. He made him confess he's nothing but sin. How so? When Christ brings you to publicly confess you're on the Lord's side, when he turns you from you and makes you to go to be on the Lord's side, we're confessing, I am sin. You, Aaron could have confessed that one sin, and he really hadn't confessed much. But by going with the sons of Levi to Moses, and siding with, Mo with Moses, and being on the Lord's side, they were saying, all we are is sin. When a believer confesses Christ in baptism, they're saying, all I am is sin. All my righteousness, my best religious worship is nothing but sin. All I've ever done is sin. All I am is sin. That's what we say when we side with the Lord. We're siding with the Lord against ourselves. We're saying, I acknowledge my transgression. My sin is ever before me against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. This was the man pointing the finger. This was the man who's saying, there's the guilty ones right there. Now he's on the Lord's side saying, I'm the guilty one. Are we on the Lord's side? This is where we got to be brought, to the Lord's side. And then Christ effectually makes his child consecrate ourselves to him, denying ourselves and all others. Now watch this, verse 27. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from the gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother. And every man his companion. And every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that God may bestow upon you a blessing this day. Moses commanded them to use their sword and slay their nearest and dearest loved one. You see, when they, when they went over to Moses and they went on the Lord's side, there was some there that heard the same word. And they stiffened up their neck and they said, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And Moses said, you strap on your sword and you kill every one of them. You kill them. Consecration to Christ is more than publicly saying we're on the Lord's side. There's a lot of people who will say they're on the Lord's side publicly in the waters of baptism because they love somebody and they're trying to please them. There's a lot of people. I've seen, I've seen spouses leave the gospel as soon as something happened to their husband. There's a lot of people that are in the gospel for vain reasons. It's more than that. It's more than that. More than just publicly confessing you on his side. He calls us to deny, to deny our own sinful selves. That's what's pictured here with them killing their nearest loved one. When he brings you to see your sin and your guilt and he makes you convert you to the Lord's side, first one you're going to take vengeance on is yourself. And he calls us to deny our dearest loved ones. And he calls us to deny our former religious companions. Why? Why does he do all this? Christ must have the preeminence. There must be no competition in my heart or yours with Christ. There can be no compromise with anybody 
We have to go to Christ. We have to be on his side. Go to Matthew 10, and let's read this. And Matthew 10, verse 32. Our Lord Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Now he's going to tell us what it is to do that. Think not that I come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Uh, he's not telling you and me to strap on a sword and go into this world and kill our nearest loved ones and our companions and family members in our own self. But he's saying that's what, the, that's what he's going to do. He's going to do that. He's the sword. What think you of Christ? That's the great divider. Now watch. For I'm come to set a man. And see there? He's the sword. I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. But he that loveth father or mother more than me, he not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me, is not worthy of me. That's going to cause a lot of pain, brethren. A lot of pain. But now listen. He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. And he that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. In Luke he said this, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he can't be my disciple. What he's saying there is, we can't have any competition with Christ. He, you love your loved ones and you do what you can for them and you want them to hear the gospel. He's not saying hate them. But nothing can come between us and Christ. When it does, he's going to bring us out from that. He's going to separate us from that. Whether it's a loved one, if it's your dearest loved one, then that shows you nothing can come between you and him. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Men are fond of saying, well, I saved in free will works religion, but later I came to the doctrines of grace. Let me tell you what that is. Christ makes us mortify that sinful rebel. He's going to make you mortify that sinful rebel if he's done a work in you so that he's preeminent. But folks that do that haven't been consecrated by his effectual power. They're protecting mom and daddy's golden ox. That's what they're doing. They'd rather offend God than it get out that, to mom and dad that they think they're lost. That's what it is. It's loving father and mother more than Christ. Christ's going to make you shake size with him against, and against your own self. It's loving self more than Christ. He's going to make us take sides. And stop protecting the companions we love. He's going to make us stop protecting our own vain refuge. He's going to make us say, let God be true and every man a liar. He's going to do this with our religion. He's going to do this with our sins. He's going to do this with whatever it is that we're hanging on to that's separating us from him. Listen, thankfully, thankfully, this is a great blessing. We're not going to get away with anything before God. Aren't you glad? He's not going to let his child get away with anything. He's going to break you. And that's a wonderful breaking. Because you find him altogether lovely. You find true freedom. You find, find true liberty following him. He's going to do this. He won't let anything vie for his attention. The sword of the Spirit. They strap it on their sword. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God. And the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword because Christ is riding on his horse with that double-edged sword going out of his mouth and he's going to cut to the thoughts and intents of a man's heart. What makes a man sit and hear the gospel for years and years and years and years and years and then one day find fault with what he's hearing? He finally heard it. 
And that gospel went through the chink in his armor and got in there to where his refuge was and started putting salt in that wound. And he said, I'm not going to have that. And that's what we'll do until Christ blesses that word and makes us bow and say, I got I to gotta be done with that. I got to be done with that, whatever it is. He makes you honest. Brethren, true repentance, true consecration is a sinner taking sides with God against himself, against his nearest, dearest idols, against his dearest companions, against his dearest loved ones, even against his own self. And when he does that, he justifies God as true. Now listen. All the people that heard uh, John and the publicans justified God. How? being baptized with the baptism of John. You know what they did by that public baptism? They said, we're justifying God. He's right. We're sinners. We're wrong. He's right. We're on the Lord's side. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. That's what you have here. You have some that went on the Lord's side and they said, God's right, we're wrong, we're sinners, God's just, we need him. And the others that didn't said, we reject what God says about us. We're not that, we're not that big a sinner. There wasn't anything wrong with this idol. And they died. They died. Now notice there's 12 tribes and only one of them sided with the Lord. This is not going to be popular. You're going to be a remnant amongst the multitude. God's people always are. But when he consecrates you to him, he will make you delighted to be a multitude, to be a remnant amongst the multitude. He makes this word effectual. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? You're the temple of the living God. God's in you. God said, I will dwell in them. I'll walk in them. I'll be their God. They'll be my people. Paul said, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean. This is totally different than the folks who say, now, now uh, you can't touch that substance and you can't touch that wine or that alcohol or that tobacco or that or that or that. Well, don't touch it to the point of drunkenness because that's the sin. But he's talking about people right here. He's talking about unbelievers. He's talking about vain, will-worshipping workers who, who thumb their nose at God and say, we don't care what God said. We, we reject the counsel of God against ourselves. God gives you a heart to come out from among them. He don't say debate with them. He don't say try to explain the gospel to them. He don't say try to put it in such a way that they can kind of understand and they'll kind of agree with you. He says, come out from among them. That's what he said. And that's what he makes his people do. We have this promise. And then when you have the promise of God in your heart, he makes you cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. He makes you want to be clean on the outside and the inside. And when you're out, you're not in. And that's holiness. When he's brought you out and he separates you, that's holiness. Folks who separate themselves and point the finger and say, well, they're guilty and they did this and that and the other, and I'm not coming around them because they might taint me. Well, thank you. You, you stay away because you might taint them. That's a bunch of vanity. That's a bunch of idolatry. That's a God-hating, judging beast is what that is. God's going to separate his people from that. Thank God he does. Because in the process of doing this, here's what he's going to do to you. He's going to make you see what Christ did for you. And that's where humility comes from. That's, where, that's, that's what makes us throw away that, that pharisaical whip and throw away and, and have a right understanding of the scriptures 
is when he does that, he makes you see what Christ did for you. First, you've got to see what a sinner you are. Then you've got to be made to see that your idols are nothing. Then you've got to be brought to the Lord's side, and you've got to be made to forsake with everything else for Christ and be consecrated to him, devoted to him. And then he's going to show you this. He's going to show you what Christ did. And this is what's going to bring you down and make you rejoice. He says there in verse 30, came to pass on the morrow, Moses said to the people, he ain't talking to all the people. He's talking to the ones on the Lord's side. You have sinned a great sin. Yes, they all sinned a great sin, but he's talking to the ones on the Lord's side. You've sinned a great sin. And now I'll go up unto the Lord, peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. Moses ain't worried about them on the other side. He talking about these right here. Those that the Lord separated out. Moses returned unto the Lord and he said, All oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt, if you're willing, Father, forgive their sin. Now watch it. And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written, blot me out. You've sinned a great sin. Moses is talking to the sons of Levi who have been separated to Christ. Christ makes his people, his elect remnant, see that we deserve, we deserve the sword of justice just like the rest. We've sinned a great sin. The others, in fact, didn't even see that they had sinned a great sin. They didn't think they had. He only makes his people see you're the great sinner. You deserve to be slain just like they were. Senator, do you realize there's not a difference between you and the vilest idolater in this world right now, right there, where you sit? You think of whatever it is that you think is so bad in this world and that you hate so bad and it turns your stomach and you don't have anything to do with that person. That's you. That's me. It, it's a lot worse than we think it is. And there's no difference between the most wicked, God-hating rebel on this earth except for this. Christ stood in our room and place and took our place. That's the only difference. See, that sword had to fall on them because they were guilty, but that sword had to fall on you and me too because God's holy and he's not going to clear anybody. You're going to die in Christ or you're going to meet God and die yourself, but you're going to die. It's coming. When you least expect it, you're going to look up and Christ is going to be standing there with a shout and he's going to be throwing the tables down at you and saying, you've broken the whole law of God if you don't have him. If you don't have him. But for his people, we had to have forgiveness with God before God could have anything to do with us. We had to be forgiven by God before God could receive us and have communion with us. And so atonement had to be made for our sin. A price had to be paid to satisfy God's justice and God be honored in his holiness before God could have mercy on us. Moses wasn't interceding for those that, they, that were slain. He was interceding for the ones God separated out. God separated his people in eternity and election. Christ separated them on the cross, and, and the Spirit separates them. Christ died for those that are sanctified, those that were separated and set apart because he succeeded. He's going to bring them all to be on his side because he satisfied justice for them. Christ's work was not for everybody. It was for his people. Now, go with me over to Psalm 22. Whenever our Lord Jesus took our place, he went to the Father and said, Father, put their sin on me so you'll be just to pour out wrath on me. Now listen, put their sin on me so you'll be just to pour out wrath on me and blot me out so you can spare them. That's what Christ did for his people. 
And God awoke the sword. He said, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against him that is my fellow. And he awoke that sword, and he plunged that sword in his own son. You imagine the sorrow that day when 3,000 people were slain in that camp. That's more than people than died in the World Trade Center. Isn't it? Imagine the sorrow that day. That's nothing compared to the sorrow that we behold on the cross. When our Lord Jesus Christ was forsaken of God the Father for three and a half hours and bore the darkness of his separation, we don't know what was taking place there, but we don't want to know. Here it is. Verse 1, Psalm 22, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. Look at verse 7. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head. They say, trust in the Lord that he deliver him. Let him deliver him. See, and he delighted in him. Many, verse 12, many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have set me around about. They gaped upon me with their mouths like a ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart's like wax. It's melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my jaws. And thou... My God, my Father, the one I love perfectly. This is what hurts so badly. You brought me here into the dust of death for dogs. That's you and me, sinner. Worthless, God-hating, repulsive dogs. We compassed him. We compassed him who's the holy, spotless, righteous one. We're the assembly of the wicked. And we enclosed him. They pierced my hands and my feet, and I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. Aha, aha! We knew he was an imposter. Ah, the other shoe, the other shoe fell. That's what we've been waiting on. That's what we've been anticipating. We knew it all along. I said it. Did y'all hear me? I said it. I said that's what was going to happen. Aha, aha! That's about the worthless, awfulest thing a man can say. They part my garments, they cast lots for my vesture. Be not thou far from me, O Lord, my strength. You're my strength. Haste thee to help me. And then God said, that's enough. God said, justice is satisfied. God said, my law's been honored. And with his stripes, we're healed. Everybody he represented is healed perfectly. So now, when you sin, when you fall into the same vile, wicked, idolatrous sins, well, does a believer really do that? They've been brought out of Egypt. So have we. They had seen all those miracles at the Red Sea. So have we. They had been fed in the wilderness. So have we. And they still committed idolatry, and so do we. And our Lord Jesus goes to the Father, and he says, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin. They've made them gods of gold. And he says, Yet now if you'll forgive me their sin, if, if thou wilt forgive their sin. And he says, If not, now listen, if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord says to Christ, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Sure will. But this is what he said, Concerning those for whom you died, my son, for whom you were forsaken, they've not sinned against me. I have no record of their sin. There's no record of their sin. I don't remember them ever sinning. 
And he says, and they'll never be blotted out of the Lamb's book of life ever. Not ever. And I'll tell you what that does for you. When God brought you that place to see that, for one, Aaron's not standing up now saying it's their fault. <laughs> he grinds that idol to powder. And for anybody else that is, he'll make you say, I tell you what, you want to charge my brother? Block me out, it's dead. Just block me out and let him go free. That's where he brings you. That's where he brings you. It's called loving kindness. Mercy. Forgiveness. Reckon there's anything we ever done as bad as what they did that day. I mean, they were worshiping another god. We're worshiping an idol. Everything we've ever done is that bad. They betrayed God. Aaron betrayed God. He betrayed his brother. He betrayed the people. And Moses said, spare him and blot me out instead. I think Moses has seen Christ, don't you? You reckon he had? I believe he's seen, seen the Lord today. I believe he understood something about substitution. And the Lord says then, he says, verse 34, Now go, lead the people to the place I've spoken unto thee. I'm never going to blot them out. They're forgiven. Now lead them to the promised place I promised. And it goes on to show there, he'll correct us for our sin. And he'll protect us from all who sin against us with plagues. That's what he did to them. But he does that because he's a loving father and a faithful shepherd and all our righteousness. And I pray he'll bless that word now and slay our flesh and make us consecrate ourselves to the Lord and take sides with him. Amen.